So um, after five years of working in IT, it's uh, now I feel like I know a little bit of both, but definitely want to know more. And this is the idea behind this concept. I hope you guys enjoy it. And now I'm going to introduce to Professor Luis Pereira. He was an amazing teacher <laughs> in university for me and uh, still look up as a mentor and today he's here to help you deconstruct a little bit this uh, black box that is the computer. I hope you guys enjoy it. So, good afternoon to everyone. When she launched me this uh, challenge of coming here and can try to open a little bit this black box that is a computer, I immediately accepted because uh, considering also the frame and the topics that you are studying, sometimes you may be not aware of what is really happening and how the computer or some components of the computer is made. So I really appreciate the invitation. I also appreciate the, the availability Escola Portitu, ou Escola 42, uh, to, to receive me today. And so, uh, exactly to start my brief talk with you, that I hope to turn it also somehow interactive. So, this is exactly the beginning. So, what is behind uh, the generations of zeros and one that provides you the ability to program and to make logic operations with? Processor, for instance, or to store information in a memory. And so, first thing to realize this is done already for, I would say, one century, and everything started with that thing that is on your left hand side. Okay? I don't know if you are aware of what that is. It's a valve, or also known as a vacuum tube, and was indeed the first device that allowed to create zeros and ones because it has three terminals. Basically, you were controlling the current that flows between two terminals to a third terminal that was a grid, controlling electrons flying from one side to the other. So this happens in vacuum in order to allow you to generate electrons and then to fly from one side to the other. And this was the mainstream until the mid-century of the 20th century. Uh, indeed, the transistors started to become very popular in the 60s and they were also becoming popular because there was a kind of race to reach the moon, if you uh, recall some history. So there was a big effort on creating more efficient and smaller uh, circuits, because if I put here a picture of a whole computer operated with valves, it would be kind of a room like this, with maybe a processing power of uh, some transistors, or some integrated circuits that I will show you later small in different systems. So it was impossible to bring such things to the moon and that's why some efforts resulted, big efforts, resulted in things like this. So the vacuum tubes were replaced by transistors. And the transistor, forget this one here, is basically something that operates like a tap. So you can consider that you have water in your source and this is subsimilar also to the name that we give to one terminal of the transistor, that is source. And you have the valve, that we call gate. And you have sink, that in the transistor we call the drain. And basically, what you do is to control the water that flows from the source to the sink by adjusting the valve, the gate. So basically, you may have water flowing or no water flowing, and this in these two states, we have the zero and the one. So information pass or information does not pass through the transistor. Nowadays, the most used transistor is this one. It's called MOSFET, okay? Metallic oxide semiconductor field effect transistors. And in a very simple way to explain, we have here an electrode, we have here an insulator, we have here another material that behaves as a conductive, so it's a kind of capacitor, and you apply a voltage here, you can control the charge that you accumulate here under this uh, insulating layer, and you can create a, a channel that connects the source to the drain and the current can flow. If you remove the voltage, the current 
will not flow because their channel will be slow. Field effect, because the effect that gives rise to the accumulation of charge is originated by electrical work. Okay. Indeed, the name is not accumulation, it's inversion in a MOSFET, but in order to be easier to understand, we can realize how it works, thinking this way. So, this small thing made an entire revolution on the way you do electronics. Okay? Because it allows a very important thing, that is miniaturization. Okay? So, I will explain later how this is. Do you know what is this picture on your left hand side? Sand. Do you know what it is? What is this piece? Silicon wafer with several integrated circuits made of billions of transistors. So that is where everything starts. This is the final product that you get. From there to there, many weeks, many complex process that I will not explain here. Apparently I had to know all of them uh, when she was studying, but now I will not uh, uh, overload with this. But it's a very complex process that involves very clean rooms, very clean, 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 with almost no particles inside. And I will also show why, why this is important. But first you need to purify. From that you make silicon. Silicon is the most used semiconductor still nowadays to make integrated circuits. So you create these wafers that come from crystals that are grown, that are bigger than us, where they are like diamonds, big diamonds. Indeed, the same structure of silicon is similar to the diamond structure. So it's indeed a diamond-like structure that is a big diamond with 40 centimeters in diameter and 3 meters uh, high, that you cut some slices that we call it silicon wafers. And everything happens processing these silicon wafers through very complex processes. Since a wafer enters in the production site, until you have this, it could take eight weeks. Okay. So very, many, many processes, and very complex ones, as I explained. You already heard that these uh, ships or microchips war where all the know-how is in Asia, because all this know-how is very valuable. Okay, so only few companies in the world are able to make the last technologies in transistors. Something like I will show you. Later. So this is the end product. Not exactly the end product because then you need to individualize and encapsulate these circuits. Everything started with this man here, Jack Kilby. Okay? Jack Kilby was the one to demonstrate that you could integrate, you could make integrated circuits. It was a very rough and archaic, prehistorical, I would say, demonstration of um, integrated circuits because what Kilby did was just basically integrate two transistors in the same substrate. So you take a piece of semiconductor, a bar, of, I guess this one's words in germanium, was not even in silicon, and make two transistors in the same device that you connect them in the same substrate. So it's, if you think today it was, it is like very easy to do. At that time, in the mid, mid uh, century, last, last century, so in the 20th century, was really amazing to demonstrate that this was possible. Just two devices, I told you that now we have billions of them connected in the same way. Okay? Just two devices, but okay, it was the beginning. And we, we, this guy was only awarded with Nobel Prize in the 2000, 2000 something, I don't remember exactly, but I think it was in 2000, Nobel Prize of Physics. And so basically he made possible, or he created the roots to have something like moving from this to this. Okay? So what you have here is a circuit that you create getting some discrete components, resistor to resistors, and you connect some resistors and transistors, and you make a circuit. Okay? What you have here is the same thing, miniaturized, everything integrated in the same substrate, in the same silicon substrate, everything made on the same silicon substrate. So you can make this type of circuit that is very simple, you have here 12 or 13 uh, transistors in a very small uh, uh, piece of semiconductor where, as I said, you have millions of them interconnected between them to make logic circuits. And I will finalize my presentation making two, uh, showing you two very simple logic circuits. More important than that, not only the size was reduced and is being constantly reduced, 
but also the way you connect these devices in, in, in a way to make some uh, building blocks for logic operations is also made in several layers that I exemplify here, but you can see in more detail here. So the transistors are only here at the very bottom of this picture, that is the surface of the wafer. And then you connect a transistor here to another transistor in another location of the wafer using several layers of highways built like one over the others to make possible these connections to happen in different locations of the wafer. Okay? So you can go up to 10 levels of localization. If you get rid of all the insulating and supporting layers that exist here, holding these connection layers, you get the picture like this. So this is just the copper that is used to connect different transistors in different locations. And you see the different levels that you have in a microcircuit to connect all these transistors. So you have several levels, you see bridges of connections passing over each other in different levels, so you can go, as I said, up to 10 levels. So it's very complex to create this, as I said, and that's why it takes so much time and so much effort and energy to make it. Do you know what is this C4004? The first microprocessor created by Intel. This was indeed the first microprocessor to be used in a computer. Okay? Or any kind of integrated microprocessor. At that time, we had on that, on that uh, processor 2,300 transistors only. Only. They were already something like 100 microns in dimension. So each transistor was more or less the thickness of your pair. Depends if you have strong hair or if you have weak weak hair, but or more or less roughly the diameter of your hair. So you can immediately realize that at that time they were already very small. It was in seventy four, five something like that. This is a more recent uh, processor. Okay, not even the, I would say the more advanced ones you have. This is with more than 64 cores nowadays, a processor, sorry. But this one has already 2.5 billion transistors, okay? In this dimension, that is not much bigger than the previous one. So if you see that you increase the dimension not that much, but you have such level of integration that each transistor inside must be much smaller. So we are talking about few nanometers in dimension. Nanometers, I will explain later for you in terms of scale to understand what is a nanometer or what is indeed the dimension of a transistor nowadays compared with something that we are that we all know. And this guy, very important, unfortunately passed away this year recently, this early this year, was Gordon Moore, one of the co-founders of Intel. And that on the beginning of this race for miniaturization of the transistors and integration of transistors, putting more and more in the same substrate. And he predicted, he saw the trends in the beginning and he predicted, okay, so this is basically will lead us to a kind of duplication of the number of transistors that we have in the integrated circuit every year. Okay? Uh, and so he coined what we call the Moore's law. Okay? And it's indeed a kind of law that if in the beginning it was a kind of analysis, just analyzing the trend, it became a kind of golden rule for the microelectronic industry. So everyone was trying to fit in this growth tendency and duplicate the number of transistors in a microprocessor. Okay. Somewhere, somewhere here, there was a change in the, in the concept that was you moved from one core only that exists to, to process information to the multi-core concept that indeed in the processor you have several processing cores inside the same processing unit. This happened because to follow this trend it was not possible to, to do it in another way and also because maybe you don't remember because it was already almost 30 years ago for sure you don't remember but at that time the speed of, of this is curiosity the, the processing speed of a processor was, was higher than it is nowadays. 
That is, you had processors working at 4 GHz or 3.4 GHz. And nowadays it's very hard to find something that operates at 3 GHz. <coughs> what happens is that at that time it was impossible to proceed this increase in speed with just one core. And so the strategy was, okay, let's create multiple cores that operate at low frequencies, but you increase the computation capacity because you have several cores working in parallel. So you indeed, overall, you increase the capacity for processing. Uh, I will not enter into details, but this led to a kind of change uh, on the way, on the architecture of the, of the processors, going from the direction of the multi core. And that way, the, the Moore's law was possible to continue. And so you're integrating more and more transistors in the same device, increasing the speed, it stopped. Because it's interesting because the processing speed of the cores was following the same tendency until the 90s. It was increasing, increasing, the same following the same law. And after that time, it stagnated. Okay? But the number of transistors that we integrate in the same area continued to increase. Okay? Because you continue to miniaturize. And this was resulting, uh, kind of was a result of the multi-core uh, concept that we were creating processes with more and more cores. Okay. So you have here examples of what already happened quite recently when we look to a transistor, like from the cross-section of the transistor. So looking from the side. I will not again enter in details, but to say that nowadays we are somewhere here, where each transistor has a dimension of 10 nanometers. And again, I will put something in scale for you to understand what the 10 nanometers is. And this is already 7, 4, 3. And here, do you know what is this? Pass from 3 to 28. Because it's predicted that the evolution of transistors will, it will not be considered in terms of dimension of the transistor, but also the number of atoms that exist in the transistor. Okay? So it means that the transistor will have a dimension of 20 atoms. And uh, so on, so on. Okay. 18 atoms. Who knows what happens after this? Just to say that the physics or the laws of physics change a lot if you are working with something with 90 nanometer and if you are working with something with 20 atoms. Everything is described in a different way. Okay, so even to be honest, I guess the guys that design the circuits nowadays, they don't know exactly how this will be handled. So they will just follow the rule, test what happens, and then let's see what we get from that. But to understand the dimension, we are talking to, we think about 20 atoms. Okay? Crazy. And so the structures of the transistors are changing. If you remember the first one I showed, was a kind of planar device. Nowadays you have concepts like transistors all around, that is, you have here the silicon, on the other side you have, you have here the drain, on the other side of this wire you have the source, and you control the current flowing through this wire, through this electrode that is the gate, and here is this leading layer. What is the advantage of this? You have a channel that is formed all around this wire. So, with the space of the wire, you have much more area for the current to flow than if you have just a planar device, okay? It's the same like here, maybe here it's easy to understand. If you look here, the current flows from this side to the other side. If it was just a planar device, the current would flow just on this surface, from this side to the other. If you make a three-dimensional transistor, that is, in this case, we are talking about three-dimensional transistors, the current can flow from on this face, on the face underneath, okay? And in this top surface. So, if you look from the from the top, the device only occupies this dimension on the wafer. But you have much more area for the current to flow. Basically, you can triplicate or more the area that you have. So, with the same foot, foot, uh, foot, uh, footprint, you have much more capability to drive current. And driving current means faster transistors, smaller, more current, faster transistors. They can operate at faster frequencies. And here you have an image, microscope image, electron microscope image of such transistors. And as I told you, they have kind of five nanometers in dimension. So 
this is five nanometers. And what uh, is five nanometers? This is the coronavirus. Okay? So your transistor, the coronavirus at the same scale. So you see the dimension of the transistor now. Okay? This would pass through the masks that you use on your to protect your coronavirus. So the EP90 or FP45, I don't remember the, the reference of the masks that we use for coronavirus will not be effective if you have a transistor flying. <laughs> so you would bring transistors. You would take a virus from, from the computer. <laughs> and so my last slide, and I told you that is not uh, very complicated, that uh, I don't want to, to turn it very complex for you also to understand is how you make operations with transistors. So this is a symbol of a transistor, this is another transistor. And just to explain, for instance, how you create op logic operations. This is called AND gate. <coughs> it means that to have here one at the exit, at the output, you need to have one at both inputs. So if you open this transistor, so if you put this transistor in a high state, you have current from here, going here, but it will be stopped here if this is not as well at the <coughs> high state. So if you put this at high state, current can flow and you have high output, one. If you have one of these at zeros, either this one at zero or this one at zero, the current will not go from the supply to the output and you have a zero. So that's hand gate because you need, you need to have the input one and, and input two high to have a high output. Another gate is, for instance, power gate. So it means that either one or the other should be high in order to have a high output. And the configuration is like this. If this is high, you have a path for the current to go from the supply to the output. If this is low, but this is high, you have this path here to the current to flow. If both are low, the output. So it means that if you draw a very simple logical table, this will be basically on for all the combinations except for zero and zero here. And in that case, that will be one at the output only in one situation, that is when you have this one and this one. Okay? Very simple logical operations done with these things that behave like valves. And so this makes the connection to the original device that was uh, that I presented that were the valves that were used in the initial computers. So with that I hope that you had more insights what's going on inside the computer. And again to thank you very much for the opportunity to share with you this small let's say uh, presentation but I hope that uh, you could learn something and of course now I'm open for your questions. Thank you very much. So um, we talked about the 
Moore's Law, and we are going to towards this uh, crazy technology, which is like a single atom transistor and crazy concepts that definitely bend the rules of physics. Are we reaching a limit in this Moore's Law? Well, this is a very nice question. I'll put here this slide because. Uh, if you see this distortion here, it's basically some points where people start to think, okay, this is a disruption of the rules law, okay? And, and you see kind of deviation in it, okay? Uh, this was reinvented uh, several times in a way to follow, but as I mentioned, this was a kind of golden rule that the semiconductor industry tried to follow um, and push themselves to provide better and better uh, processors and memories because the same law also applied to the memory density that you can have in a specific area so the increase of the memory density that you can have so uh, yes we'll reach a, a physical limit for the, the most law it's, it's impossible to continue and um, this as I said is being already observed and nowadays I would say people are not paying much attention already to the Moore's Law, okay? Um, because also the Moore's Law was kind of reshaped. As I told you, first was for the number of transistors and also the processing capabilities of the processors. At some point, they realized that it was not possible to continue with the processing capabilities or processing speed to follow the rules of uh, Moore's Law. So it's just fixed on the number of transistors per, uh, per processor. And this will continue some more time until we reach really the physical limit, as you said, that there would be few atoms, transistors, and new technologies will, for sure, to, 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 to replace the conventional technology. But that will stay here for a long time, yeah. because there is a lot of investment, there is a lot of know-how, and as I said in the beginning, uh, nowadays the, the, the companies and the countries that hold this know-how will continue to dominate, I would say, the semiconductor technologies in the future. So, these new technologies will come later and will continue, at least for a few years, going on the direction of the transistor that operate in this way. And maybe they will get other architecture of transistors uh, as they invented these three-dimensional transistors, okay? What will happen is indeed when you reach few atoms, and I told you that, the physics change. This single electron transistor is already existing, uh, but sing single atom or single electron transistor is already, already existing. They were demonstrated, but the, the problem is that when you reach these levels um, of dimensions, uh, for instance, phenomena like temperature become very critical, uh, noise in the, in the, that is very critical also. Uh, so something will change for sure. Uh, but my perspective is that in the next, let's say, 10 years, 20 years, we'll still have this computer uh, architecture dominating, uh, dominating the technology. It's like cars, as you, so you can make a comparison. Okay? Electrical cars are here, they're getting a lot of traction, but in order to dominate the, the market, many other things will, will need to be, need, need to happen. So, um, yeah. The, but the, for sure, the, the, the Moore's law will deviate a little bit. But if you see here, what is here is a prediction from Intel. In order to continue this, they will need to achieve one trillion transistor in the processor in 2030. And to do that, you see here some of the technologies they're already implementing to, to reach it. So if they have this target for 2030, for sure in 2030 we'll have one trillion transistor in the processor. But of course, other technologies will be already in the backstage being prepared for replacing these, these, these ones. Because, as I also mentioned, uh, this is becoming true, okay? This is the reality nowadays, this is what is happening, and this is plans that they have for, for so this will happen, for sure, okay? In the next stage. More questions? So, would uh, a change in materials, because as far as I understand it, silicon is not a very good conductor. 
It's not the bad thing on the yeah, back. So would that help? It's a yes and no. We can start from your first uh, comment. Indeed, silicon is not the best semiconductor that exists. Okay? There are much better semiconductors with much better capacity, let's say, to drive current. But silicon is cheap. It's easier to obtain. It's very abundant. And that's why it became the, let's say, the most used semiconductor. Okay? The limit now, I would say, to go from here to here, and let's assume that from the physical point of view, everything will work with you here. It's not exactly the semiconductor. It's the tools to make the devices. Okay? To reach devices like these dimensions here, with, uh, with 10 nanometers or 20, uh, 50 nanometers, you need one technique that is the most limiting, limiting one, is what we call lithography. Okay? Because everything that you make on top of the surface, you need to transfer some patterns to what you create on the surface. And this is repeated 100 times during the process. And this is the most limiting uh, process because you need to define these patterns with very small dimensions. And the tools that are used to do that uh, in order to be compatible to industrial production is very challenging. I can tell you that if you have the intention to open a factory to make transistors, you need to invest, to invest I don't know, 1 million more euros but maybe 40% of your investment would be just for this tool that is used to make the, the packaging. So, all the other tools to make the position of the different materials, to create the crystals of silica, to encapsulate, to uh, deposit the metals that you need, would be nothing compared with this tool. So, this is really the limiting process. So, the limiting point nowadays is how to create these dimensions or devices with this dimension, because these are somehow complex architectures. If you see here, uh, oh, could be here. If you see this picture, so these are complex architectures, so it's 26 nanometers in height, so 26 nanometers is more or less this, the protein, spike proteins in the, in the coronavirus, with five nanometers uh, width, and you need to create this, kind of uniform uh, way in the wafer, okay? And besides this, you have here other layers deposited. So you have here a thin layer that should have three or four nanometers, then the, the metal around it. So it's very complex, but the most complex is how to pattern this, how to create these patterns. And so I would say that the most challenging part will be to do, this, to do it. The silicon will withstand that until we reach this 18A technologies. Of course, after that, you need to go to other semiconductors. And this was already a promise some years ago, when people started to talk about graphene. It came as a kind of a good promise, but graphene is not a semiconductor. You cannot control the current that flows. It's basically a metal, or as a metal-like material, so you cannot control the current. There are other materials popping up, but I guess maybe Carolina will talk when she talks about quantum computing. The next big leap, let's say, in the technology will be really <coughs> quantum computing. And this is a different story of this one, okay? Another thing that another colleague will come and will talk is neuromorphic computing. That is also another way to do uh, computation that emulates basically our brain. It consumes much less power in principle than the conventional processing technology that I described here, okay? Uh, and there is also a lot of efforts to bring this type of computation because nowadays you can emulate the brain operations but using the same technology that we have here. So that it is, let's say, power consum con con consumption is high. What people are trying to make is to make these circuits from other materials, other architectures, not indeed, for instance, using transistors but using kind of memory strips that we will hear my other colleague talking about that could really change a little bit the way the computation is made, okay? But just to finalize, I would not say that the silicon is limitation so far, okay? And when we leave silicon behind, I guess we'll be changing also the concept of how to make computation that will go further to quantum computing and other types of computation, okay? I have a question for the next question. Yeah. Uh, so you mentioned 
uh, you mentioned the uh, quantum computers. Uh, at what size, I mean, when it makes things smaller, it would be more affected by quantum attacks, I guess. Uh, how small can you, like when you have a couple of atoms, uh, when will it start to be a problem with the quantum attacks in the regular CPS? To be honest, it's already affected, okay? Uh, as I said, we are not dealing with uh, devices that are very small, where, for instance, the equations that were used to describe the current that flows in a transistor 10 years ago, or 20 years ago, or 30 years ago, are, not, are no longer uh, possible to, to, to do it. What you see, for instance, nowadays is that you have a limitation on the, on the speed of the electrons, what the speed that the electrons can, can reach. So when this limits a little bit, uh, the velocity that you can commute from one to zero in the, in the transistor. So you have already these effects, these effects happening. There are odd effects that I will not mention, but uh, odd carriers, uh, uh, drain, uh, uh, induced lowering barriers, so something, some strange names, but just to say that there are effects that already puts you away from the ideality when you think on how these devices work, okay? And so, for instance, I'll give, I'll give you another example. People now, uh, in the past 10 years ago or 20 years ago, when they went to miniaturize the transistors, they were following rules, okay? There were kind of rules. You go to the design, you apply a minimization rule, you treat everything by the same, same, same factor, and you could already ex expect what would happen to the current, to the heat dissipation, everything was more or less expected. What they start to observe is that you start to shrink, shrink, shrink. You could no longer apply this uh, scaling rule. rule. It was impossible because some components were not possible to be scaled like a kind of uh, geometrical rule. And also the things that were happening and that you could predict were no more able to be predicted. So you start to see some effects that you didn't see before. So it, just to say that you already see some quantum effects on the technologies nowadays. And so that's why I also said that People now design, they check what happens, and okay, so they try to understand and live to the, what the device gives you, okay? Not going too much on the prediction, of course, not. you have always ways to try to predict, but the reality is also sometimes far from the, from the predictions that you make. So, you already have these effects, uh, the quantum effects that come, as you mentioned, very, very, very correctly, from the, from the, the miniaturization. And just to say, I was uh, uh, some minutes ago talking about uh, single electron transistors. Uh, so it's, these are transistors made of very small, no, no, part, uh, small particles of semiconductors, where the current no longer flows like in a continuous way between one side and the other. So it flows only when the voltage that you put in the valve, the gate, reach certain level. So it has a kind of step. Not the continuous increase in the current, but kind of steps in the current. Uh, because you start to have some specific, and sorry for the jargon, but you start to have some specific uh, energy levels that the electrons could occupy, and so you need to apply a certain amount of voltage on this to have the current flowing. If you don't apply, the current will not flow, or is stabilized basically at a certain level. So this is a way of quantum phenomena. Indeed, this is very interesting. I will not enter details because it allows multiple logical levels in the same device. So you, instead of having just zero and one, you have multiple logical levels. So it's one of the quantum effects that could be used to, let's say, to increase the computation capability. Okay. But also to finalize, you already have quantum effects. Question. Um, we talked about um, the market and nowadays um, the whole silicon technology is uh, held by, the production is held by essentially Asia and the US. Um, not having a decentralized production of these chips could be an issue for the, um, for the industries that depend on this. Yes, we all are feeling this already. Yeah, it's a problem. Uh, and I would say more, not centralized in area, in Asia. 
they are centralized in Taiwan. And uh, maybe some of the geo geo geopolitical issues that will come in the near future will come from this fact. Because China is trying to catch up the technologies in Taiwan and they are not getting them. The know-how in this case is very important. And uh, I would say that two main companies in Taiwan could basically dominate the market from these uh, high-end microprocessors at more than 60% of the market. US is putting a lot of effort to catch up. China, for sure. Europe has always, it's always behind. We are also putting money, but at the end, I would say nothing will happen for sure. Um, or at least relevant will happen in this case. But yeah, it's a problem because uh, for instance, something happens in Taiwan, 60% of the global production of ships will be affected, so it will be a big, big, big issue. And nowadays, everything, all the supply chains are connected. Just to give an example that might have to do with uh, microprocessors, that happened. Uh, there were some floods in Slovenia. I was talking with the guy that I was in Slovenia some, some weeks after, I was talking with the guy there. Uh, stopped the factory that was producing a very specific part for a gearbox for Volkswagen Group cars. Okay, and just only that factory was producing that because only those guys had the know-how to produce this part, very precise with some specific uh, machining in the process. And so the flood destroyed this, the storehouse, um, and basically the factories of Volkswagen stopped for some, and even here of Renault stopped for some weeks because there was no part. So the supply chain nowadays is so interconnected that if something happens in, the, in the Taiwan, for instance, for sure it will suffer. And we had this during COVID. So the factories stopped, were affected, and you have a shortage on the supply of micro microprocessors and chips. And I guess since then, we never recovered this, this problem. Because as I told you, if you stop the factory, Okay, these are eight weeks, it's two months before you, you, you receive an order and you have the ship. So if you stop and you want to restart, this will take a lot of time and you will accumulate a lot of pending orders. So this will create a big delay. So concentration of knowledge is always a problem, like the concentration of raw materials for other industries, for instance batteries, uh, that you are aware of this. Uh, and uh, that, that could be really, really as I said, so if something happens in Taiwan, we'll for sure feel it <laughs> very hard and badly. Specific process that allows you to give a kind of 
For instance, this patterning process. I told you that the yield, the yield is, uh, as I said, so the number of working devices okay, that you can get from a batch. If you discover a process that increases you the yield from uh, 60 to 70%, so you already have a big advantage. And these small secrets, even if Europe makes the machines and Americans make the design, these small secrets are with the process engineers that are there in, this, in the factories, okay? And so this is what makes difference, and for instance, when I talk about China trying to mimic what happens in Taiwan, because they don't have yet the ability to do the same things they do in Taiwan, okay? And these same things are in the processing side. The same the know-how that exists for making these things is very important. And uh, to install the factory, to put it running, to create like this know-how internally also takes a lot of time, lots of investment. So it will not be immediate. So if you have in a short period of time or you turn kind of disruption in the supply chain, be big problem because I guess the US and Europe will not be prepared to mimic what is done nowadays in Europe. But yeah, they are trying to pick up and for sure I guess in America they will try they will mitigate the problem. I don't know in Europe if we will make it, but this was a problem a few years ago when we put everything in Asia to, to be produced and we were relying that here we just design things and produce machines to sell places. Then we had a problem. Okay, we have time for two more questions. Uh, uh, what uh, companies besides Intel and Samsung have a big part of the integration of to well, I would say that uh, maybe not many. You can have an AD as well that could do that. Uh, but for instance, the biggest companies in, uh, in Taiwan that produce the microprocessors they do not make these uh, Nokia operations. As you said, so TMC uh, doesn't, just doesn't do it. So, um, because I don't know. Maybe it's not an advantage to, to do it. Uh, if you are, so, for instance, so flexible in terms of working with different uh, suppliers, if you are flexible, for instance, to make new ships by demand, because they, these companies also receive, uh, when everyone designs a new ship, they have the ability to immediately process it and uh, make it, okay? So they prefer to do this type of business than just a uh, kind of vertical integration of everything. But not many are doing uh, doing this. So Intel, yes, they do. They, they do it. As I told, the AMD also does it. Um, Samsung, I think, partially, not 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 everything, to be honest, uh, in terms of the, the vertical integration. But uh, in Taiwan, it's not common to to have this. So it's a kind of business model. Yeah. Anybody? Yeah. So since we already have the, the, the quantum problems, let's say, um, does this make uh, the processing that we have nowadays a step into a quantum computer? Or <laughs> it's since I do know that they are quite different, okay, but does this help in any way, or it has nothing to do with it? We are suffering from quantum effects. It doesn't mean that we have quantum computing. Yeah. Quantum effects, it happens when you miniaturize everything and you confine electrons to a small space. Okay. So, so some strange things start to happen, as I said. So the electron starts to be they occupy some specific energies, and so this brings some effects on the, on the working mechanism of these devices. Quantum computing evolves other things, so ultimately quantum computing could evolve the spin of electrons, the ultra-measure spin of electrons. It's a different way of making the computation uh, compared with this type of computation. So, yeah, having quantum effects doesn't mean that we are going in the direction of quantum computing, but of course, some of the things that you could learn from this could be useful, okay? But the concept is different. Okay? To make quantum computing is different. So you need to be able to measure the spin of the electrons first if they are rotating in one direction or in another direction. Okay. 
do, uh, by the way, is the way we can store information so we're on the screen of the reflectors. So we know how to select if they are here or here. Yeah, um, this is going to be one of the master classes, so sure. keep up. Keep up. Keep up. Um, I do have one last question just to finalize. Um, when we talk about the silicon, it's a very um, common material and all this, and it's easy to obtain. But when we are talking about um, these uh, microelectronic circuits and nanotech, we talk also about raw materials that are critical materials, which means that they will end at some point. And we are already starting to think about crazy ideas like mining, meteorites, and stuff like this. But we will definitely reach a point where these critical materials end. We cannot mine them anymore. So what are the alternatives? What is the future of technology when this happens? Well, that is a very, very, very good question. Because uh, the easiest uh, answer would be, uh, let's recycle it. But it's not that easy. Uh, so, uh, nowadays you already have some recycling on the microelectronics industry. Typically going after the precious metals like gold. Uh, but you don't go really to the gold that exists somehow here. So you go to the PCBs typically and try to recover some metals. Or some places where maybe easier on the interconnects, for instance. Typically you also don't also use gold, so you use more copper. But Try to get it where it is easy to get. That such level of integration brings another problem that the things are so small, so concentrated, so overlapped with other things, that to recycle materials, to recover materials, is very, very difficult. Okay. And this is a problem, of course, uh, because the process to do it is possible. We can always do it. So we can grind everything and try to find this strange methods to, to recover metals and for sure it will be done in the future because we need to go and get it. Uh, nowadays it's not economical uh, viable to do it, so typically what people are doing is having mines of, of piles of electronic trash standing there. For some and some countries are already filling empty mines with electronic trash, so keep it there. Because this is indeed a good strategy, to be honest. If you think that these materials are expensive, these materials do not exist in Europe because in Europe we are very, very poor in terms of resources, especially on metals, on precious metals. Uh, and we are paying to bring these materials into Europe inside the microprocessor that we buy. So why then throw it away or send it back somewhere to be recycled? Well, if you don't have the process to recycle yet, keep it. And as I said, some countries are already filling old mines with this electronic trash, keep it there. Because sometimes in the, in the future it will be economical viable to go after these metals and maybe we will have also technologies to recover these, these metals. So one process for sure will be recycling. Will not be 100% solve possible to solve with, uh, with recycling. And um, we may face kind of a dead hand, I don't know if we will face it or not. For instance that we have a shortage of gold, we cannot proceed with gold. It's possible to proceed with other metals. Okay? The question is the performance that you get, some problems in the process that you get. Because you also need to realize that people, when you are developing a product, you go always after only, okay, one, a ratio of two things is performance over cost. Okay? So, uh, this is the maximum, let's say, golden rule that you, can, you are looking at. Nowadays, it's changing. It's also, we are introducing the kind of um, circular economy, and you are already looking for the economical impacts, social impacts, environmental impacts, but still, let's say, performance over cost. So if in the future you cannot reach the performance or the cost become, becomes prohibitive, you will find another material that will give you the best ratio that is performance over cost. For sure. So recycling is one way, substitution is another way, it will happen somehow. And maybe in the future we don't need this with these materials and we will use another one if you go for quantum computing. Maybe we will have a problem with magnetic materials or magnetic materials or something like that. Other problems will come, maybe it will not be the same problems that we are facing in our day. I, I used to say that uh, I'm kind of pessimist and optimistic in relation, kind of mixed feeling in relation to this process of substitution and the critical raw materials. 
because in one way we need to realize that it's impossible to continue with our usage of the raw materials as we are doing today because technology has evolved so far with no concerns about critical materials so we we developed all technology of technologies in the kind of concept that we have everything available it's just a question of go there and pay, okay in the future it will not be like that so we need to develop technologies in the way to work with what you have available and the things will happen again will have the same so it will be possible to replace to make new architectures, make maybe new devices, and we will we'll work with the material that we'll have for sure. And this uh, space mining is of course one alternative, will come later, I'd say in the century, but will happen for sure. And it could be one of not one alternative, I don't know, it could be, it could be really one good alternative. If you find a material full of gold, and I guess nowadays recently it was kind of uh, used about the first experiment really that will try and fix one meteorite that has it's very rich in one element. I didn't know exactly what it, what it was. And bring to the to the to the heart these, these elements could be one, one option, why not? I don't discard that. But I, I see that meanwhile we will be working also on this uh, substitution for sure and batting and recycling whatever is possible. Yeah. So, again, so sorry for taking, let's say, one hour or more of your time, but it was really nice uh, to be here with you to discuss these uh, things that uh, we deal with it, with it, let's say, every day. It's not my research area anymore, but uh, I try to keep it dated because I'm also lecturing this at university. Um, I didn't enter into much detail, also to give you, let's say, kind of more perspective. But yeah, just finalize that don't think the computer has a black box that everything is possible. Sometimes it's good to understand some of the challenges of the people that try to make possible for you to have a computer to make the nice things that you, that you do. That for me, it's amazing because my knowledge in computer stops here. Whatever you do for me is also a black box and also amazing. So I don't understand anything about programming. So uh, it's by, let's say, by default, one decision that I took because I didn't want to spend too much time in front of the computer more than I need to take, but it was my decision to do, to do so and I decided to follow in the direction that I didn't want to, to learn how to program, but I understand for sure that without that we, want, we, we wouldn't be here, but remember that without this you would also be here, so this is very important that everything starts on the sand, it's also good to, to understand, so when you go to the beach next time you see good material so it makes possible to my my computer to work. Thank you very much for your time. So thank you everybody also so um, we're gonna have some other master classes one per week um, and by the end of these master classes I want everybody coding in assembly <laughs> <laughs> to make your algorithms way faster. So we're just going to try to get here the agenda. Um, and yeah, I hope uh, your curiosity over microelectronics and nanotech continues. Um, there's loads of videos from Kurzgesagt and others that um, talk about this. So if you're curious, um, you can also just reach out to us or uh, Google a bit more about it. Yeah, okay. Okay, so these are the final dates, exactly. Do we have the date? No, no. Okay, uh, yes. no dates yet. <laughs> but uh, next week we will have uh, Diana Gaspar with uh, Nanotechnology, what is it? And with us. Which is your brother, exactly. <laughs> Uh, and then we'll do all these sessions weekly, weekly. so we will then forward with quantum computing, the revolution of armor, with Carolina, uh, and then the future of AI, uh, with Azal Kiazet uh, of AI hardware, uh, cybersecurity of the future with Anna Freire, and finish how to be an entrepreneur in a tech revolution with Anna Prata. So we really look forward to see you here with us uh, during the next weeks. And we really hope you enjoyed uh, this first master class. So thank you so much, everybody. And thank you, Professor Luis, for 
sharing it as your knowledge. 